Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Jess. Welcome back to my garden here at Roots and Refuge Farm. So I'm down here this morning enjoying a nice cup of coffee and doing some pruning and tying and weeding. There's a lot of that to be done, but I thought I would just take a minute and shoot a quick reference video for you guys answering a very, very common question we get from new gardeners, which is when do I harvest things? When do I know things are ready? And just lots of questions about the harvesting process. Right now it is mid-June, late June, just past summer solstice, so right now the days are as long as they ever are during the year. Things are growing as fast as they ever grow during the year because of those long uh, daylight hours. The garden is really cranking out. It's getting to that kind of wild stage, which I absolutely love. And it's really time to gear into harvest. So today I'm going to be kind of focusing a lot on what's growing in my garden now, because that's what I can show you. And partially what I'm going to be sharing with you today is personal preference, because you're going to develop your own personal preferences and what you like to do with things in your garden. I'll tell you why I do what I do, uh, but you may come up with a different way that's completely okay. In fact, I encourage you to figure out what works for you. You don't have to do something in the garden just because somebody else does it that way. It's a beautiful uh, opportunity for your own expression. Uh, definitely get a notebook and a pen out on this one. This is going to be one of those videos where there's a lot of information and a lot of little tips and stuff like that. And I invite you guys, if you are an experienced gardener, at any degree of experience and you have a tip or something that you like to share your own personal preference of when you like to harvest what you like to look for and what you like to do with it please put it down in the comment section below the comment section on videos like this is a trove of knowledge I learned so much from it and I just want to invite you guys to sew into that community because you're teaching people when you leave these comments people are reading these they're learning from you they're applying your tips and it's so valuable all right, so let's start walking around this garden. Please excuse my kind of silly hat. You gotta keep the sun off my face and shoulders. I'm out here a little late in the morning. I usually try to, usually try to get out here uh, about six and get everything handled by the time the sun is up. And uh, with kids and animals, mornings don't always go how you plan. That brings me to my first point. Um, the best time of day to harvest most things is in the morning before the sun touches them. Now, there are a couple of exceptions to that rule. I personally like to harvest my tomatoes in the heat of the day, in the middle of the afternoon, uh, giving them a couple of days of being dry if it possible. Um, I, like if we have a big rain coming through, I'll go ahead and harvest tomatoes because them getting a lot of water kind of dilutes the flavor. And if you pick them in that middle of the afternoon heat, uh, you're getting a lot of concentrated sugars. That can also apply for things like peppers. I think Things that you really want to concentrate the flavor of uh, that because basically when you pick in the afternoon things have less water in them whereas if you pick early in the morning before the sun is up they're gonna have more water in them so for some things you want that more water for things like greens for cucumbers for beans you want those to have the more water in them but for things like tomatoes and peppers you may want those a little bit more concentrated so you can pick them in the afternoon so here I have some cucumber plants. These are just starting to climb. Cucumbers will really sneak up on you. So here you can see, this is actually a gherkin. So this is the size that I wanna pick this. Here's a better example here. Obviously that is not anywhere near time to pick. That's just barely first set. But they grow really fast and they start as those tiny fruits. And then within a few days, uh, they're gonna look like this. And this particular variety is a, a silver cucumber, so it's supposed to be this color. And basically what I like to do is I like to harvest my cucumbers pretty young. Now if it's like a slicer or even a pickling cucumber, I know what to expect um, based on the variety it is. I know that slicers are gonna get nice and long, um, good size, pickling cucumbers are gonna be smaller. But what happens is if you leave these on the vine too long, this turns into this. Uh, most all cucumbers, when they're like mature, they turn really yellow. Uh, they get really smooth skin. They fill out a lot like this. And this is still edible. And this one actually still tastes pretty good. It's pretty sweet still, has a lot of uh, water content in it. But what happens, 
the seeds get really large. So if you have a cucumber get away from you and you have like a big monster like this, I usually will use these for juicing. I don't really like to make pickles out of them or anything like that at that point uh, because these seeds are so big. It's just nicer to eat them when they're younger. But it's not the end of the world. The, the thing is, is that especially when you're getting into like the really warm part of the summer, a lot of times when cucumbers get really big like this, they taste bad. They get really, really bitter and they're just not nearly as good as whenever you pick them young. So my favorite way to pick cucumbers is when they're first getting to the size that I, you know, I know that variety is supposed to get. So here are three varieties picked at their optimum size and one variety, it's this one, that was let go too long. With cucumbers, if you are harvesting, especially there at the beginning of the season when they're first coming on, and you're wanting to make something like you're wanting to can something or pickle something, make a batch, but you don't have enough yet, uh, the best thing you can do is soak those in some water so they can get good and hydrated and then put them in your fridge. If you put them straight in your fridge, they're going to get kind of rubbery while you wait for more to harvest. Uh, so doing that soak really helps just about anything that you're picking out of the garden except for those fruits like tomatoes. And I mean, you can't even do this with peppers. Like if you notice something's getting kind of shrivelly or wilty or rubbery after you harvest, uh, but start start soaking those just fill the sink up with water put them in there for 20 minutes or so before you dry them off and then put them in a bag or something in the fridge an old man told me that once and he called it soaking the heat off of something you had to soak the heat off of it before you put it up so it didn't wilt and I think probably from a more scientific approach what you're actually doing is allowing those uh, fruits or those vegetables those leaves or stems or whatever roots it is that you're uh, picking you're allowing those to rehydrate fully before you stick them in the fridge uh, but I still kind of end up calling it soaking the heat off <laughs> okay I'll have to promise to ignore my wheat since I'm teaching you instead of pulling them all right here is an ochre plant with a few stages of development here on one plant uh, this is a variety called Silver Queen, and so they're a light green. Different varieties are going to be different colors just straight from the beginning. This one's a light green. Uh, sometimes they'll look dark green, sometimes they'll be burgundy, sometimes you'll have those short squatty pods. Uh, the size of the pod is determined by the variety, but the maturity is all about the same, you can tell. So I like my okra just about like this. This is a couple days of growth. Basically here you can see this is a flower that is about to open and once it opens and falls off there will be a little tiny pod behind it. Uh, you can eat them this small but you're really just not getting the bang for your buck on this. If you let it grow another day they're going to be about this big. Now okra gives you a very short window to get a prime piece of food. <laughs> this is great and I always use snippers to cut okra because they have really fibrous stems and you'll tear your plant up trying to just tear it off. And this is just right. It's still it's still nice and soft. It's not woody. Uh, this is big enough for me to to roast or eat raw or pickle or dice it up and fry. Um, gonna let this one go another day. Now, if I waited even just another day or two, this thing would be massive. It would be woody and it would be largely inedible. I've joked in the past about okra going from a tasty treat to a wolverine claw in a matter of hours. And really, um, when okra gets in full swing, these plants get a little bit bigger. It's really hot outside. We're in the middle of the summer. I'm, I harvest every morning and every evening so that I can get them at just the right size because they really do grow that fast. Like in one day, it gets too big. And when they get too big, um, they're so fibrous, they're just not very good for eating anymore. But when they're young, like this, they're tasty and you can do whatever you want with them. Some varieties of okra are a little bit more forgiving than others. Probably something that you learn and experience. I can tell you, I really do like the squatty ones, like Star of David, Texas Hill Country, Old Alabama Red. I, I feel like those squatty varieties seem to stay usable longer, whereas some of the more traditional varieties like emerald and plums and spineless those can get woody a little faster and the red ones really do get woody i think a little faster jing orange and burgundy now they're all good i love growing all of those for me the best way to approach it is just to expect to have to harvest your okra a lot uh, trying to find a variety that's going to be more forgiving of harvesting there's really 
even the ones that I'm saying are better, they're not that much better. Okra gets woody when it gets big. That's just how it is. Definitely keep an eye on it and try to harvest them during that time. Basically, as soon as they start producing, they start producing when the plants are really small. Those plants are gonna get massive. They're gonna be covered in pods in just like a month. You just get in the habit of harvesting your okra every single morning and then when they really start cranking it out, you need to just get in the habit of harvesting your okra twice a day. Here is a young uh, Texas Hill Country okra pod. Now you can see this one is, is, is still very small, but in another day or so, it's gonna be a little longer, but the main thing is that these get really fat around. So it's just a different variety, looks different from the beginning. Uh, so you really kind of have to keep an eye on them and the, as they grow to know when they're the exact right size because you'll see them come on like this and then you'll see them change. With these squatty varieties, if you wait for them to be as long as a long slender variety, um, it might have already started to harden up. I really don't have a ton of leafy stuff left in my garden right now because it's getting hot and that is typically um, a cooler weather crop. But here I've got some kale, it's a little pest riddled. I still have some kale up in the front. I've got some lettuce that's going to seed. I've got some beets that I can still pull some greens off of. I've been known many times to come out and just break these off. It is better to use snippers because you're gonna get a cleaner cut. What you do with kale or lettuce or anything that you're taking the leaves off of is start from the bottom first because that those leaves are more prone to sickness and bug damage because they're closer to the ground. So it's best to leave those. And these things have a center stalk because she's gonna keep growing up and producing new leaves off the top. So eating those bottom ones means uh, you're not allowing leaves on the bottom to grow tough or get bothered by bugs and these new leaves up here are going to keep producing. Some plants are beasts and you can take every leaf off of the plant and they'll just come back and sprout more. Like if you leave the stump of a kale in your garden it's going to grow new growth. However as a general rule if you're harvesting leaves off of something you don't want to take all the leaves. Usually it's best to take the older leaves off of the bottom and leave some in the middle so that plant can continue to grow um, because they need those leaves to photosynthesize. Now they can make a comeback, but why make them, you know? So harvesting some of the leaves, that goes for lettuces, that goes for beets, turnips, anything that you're harvesting leaves off of to make greens or uh, salads or anything like that, just harvest those lower leaves first and leave some up at the top so the plant can continue to grow. Again, this is another thing that really benefits from a good soak in some cold water so that they can rehydrate and not wilt. And if it's the time of year that you're dealing with a lot of soft-bodied bugs and worms and stuff like that, a good soak in some cold salt water can really help because not only is that gonna rehydrate that plant, it's gonna cause all those creepy crawlies to come out so you're not uh, being surprised by anything when you eat your dinner. Here's some more kales that you can see how I've harvested all these bottom leaves off. This is dinosaur kale. And um, I just pull them off from the bottom and the plant just keeps growing taller. And with many kales, if they're given the time to grow, they'll get very, very tall. Um, if it's not so warm that it pushes them to see. They can get as tall as me in some cases. Now it's very warm where I live, so that doesn't usually happen. Usually they seed before that. But you can just continue harvesting on the, off the bottom and that plant will just keep producing. Here I've got some basil we can talk about. Now I made a comment on a video recently about how I like to take the flowers off of my basil and I had many people tell me hey those are edible. These are edible. You can eat these, you can put these in things, you can fry them. However, uh, if you allow your plant to fully go to seed, it's going to change the flavor of your basil. That's for most cases, I know that there are exceptions, but when plants go to seed, uh, basically the chemical compounds in the leaves of that plant go into self-protection mode. Because we have to understand that plants are not wired uh, to feed us, we enjoy eating them, but they're wired to survive. And so when this plant starts to put off seed, um, it, it basically starts releasing some chemicals that make the leaves less appetizing. This is a case with many, many vegetables that send up that center stalk and start producing flowers. A lot of times what you're gonna experience is a change in flavor in the leaves at that point. Now the flowers are gonna stay pretty tasty because the plant in its 
instinctual desire to survive wants those seed pods to be eaten. It wants those seed pods to be eaten so that they're carried in the belly of an animal or a bird or whatever and they're spread in the waist of that animal or bird. That's what it wants. But the leaves themselves kind of change flavor. So what I typically do is come and I pull the flowers off of my basil when it starts to to flower like this. The way that I pick my basil is if you'll see here, uh, you're, you've got like a stem that comes up and there's sort of a split and you'll see this fresh growth in these armpits. I pick it right at the top of that because that's gonna, each one of these is gonna go off into a stem. And by picking them like this, I'm allowing this plant just to get bushier and bushier. So when I come out and harvest basil for dinner, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for those armpits that have fresh growth. And this is the basil that I'm going to take in and cook. And what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually pruning this plant while I harvest so it bushes out and ultimately produces more. Now some basils, particularly like Thai basil here, uh, holy basil, which is actually not a true basil, but it's a medicinal Tulsi, uh, they, they flower um, let me think cinnamon basil I think is another one maybe one I think there's one called cardinal they flower and that's part of the flavor profile that you're growing that for so like in the case of this basil this Thai basil the flowers are okay but in my sweet basil I want that sweet basil to stay sweet so that's why I take those flower stalks off so let's talk about beans now you could be growing beans for snap beans green beans that's basically just a young bean that you're gonna pop the ends off and cook young and tender or you could be growing them for shelling beans or dried beans which just basically means you're going to leave them on the vine until they're dried up and the seed the bean inside of that pod gets fully mature and hardens up some varieties you can use either way some varieties you plant one plant you can harvest some of them young and eat them like green beans and you can leave the rest on the plant to dry out if you are saving seeds for any beans you're going to leave them on the plant until they dry out because you're allowing that seed to become fully mature and harden up so that it can be saved in storage for things like noodle beans and long beans and this applies to um, it, just anything that you want to eat young and tender you need to keep an eye on it when it starts developing uh, first it's going to put off a pod that's like super small obviously way too little to eat and then it's quickly going to grow to something like this this is a noodle bean then it gets to this point which is about when i like to harvest them uh, for green beans basically as soon as that bean gets to full size and what you typically expect from a green bean as soon as it hits that full size i like to go ahead and pick it because that's when that is going to be the most tender so i really watch those things as soon as they start setting and they're tiny little bitty beans i know okay i really need to check back on these over the next few days because they're going to hit that optimum point soon now you can harvest them afterwards the texture's just going to change they're not going to be as tender and soft uh, a lot of times they'll lose their sweetness if they had any sort of like sweet flavor to them and they just get tougher and more fibrous and stringy a lot of cases when they get bigger they get stringy they're still edible and a lot of times I'll still go ahead and pick those but I know I'm gonna have to cook them longer I might have to cook them with more kind of flavorants and stuff like that in the pot rather than just a quick steam which you can really do with a young bean and they reach a point uh, noodle beans or snap beans where I just goofed and I just let them get way too big and when that happens a lot of times what I'll do and I don't like to do this with a lot because if you leave a whole lot of beans on a bean plant to dry it basically says okay we're done we produced our seed we did our purpose and they stop producing but if you keep picking them they're gonna keep putting out flowers because remember that plant is wired to survive and to reproduce and for its its line to keep producing uh, so sometimes if I have a few that were on there that got too big I'll leave them and let them go ahead and dry up and harden and I'll just save the seeds for those um, if it's a variety that you can eat as a dry bean I'll just go ahead and and leave them and harden harvest them for a dry bean but ideally it's best to really get them young here's an example of a couple of beans that uh, stayed on here too long I actually decided to leave these so I could share this uh, with with you guys these are the only ones that I'm gonna leave in like this and I'll be able to save the seeds from these beans do not really readily cross so you can usually save the seeds without making any other precautions 
and uh, you can be certain that you're going to be getting a plant that is like its parent plant. I don't have a ton of root vegetables right now because uh, we've pretty much harvested those at this point. I do have some carrots here that I was going to show you guys. Now these are past the point of really needing to be harvested. Some of them are starting to go to seed here. But with carrots, uh, basically what I like to do and this goes for any root vegetables. I typically will just brush the soil away from the shoulders of that root to see how big it is. And uh, that gives me an idea if that's ready to be pulled out yet. And that's gonna go for carrots, for radishes, for beets, turnips, rutabagas, anything that's growing in the ground like that. Usually those grow, you know, right, right there under the surface. They're not growing super deep. So usually just brushing the soil away from the shoulders of that plant will give you a general idea of the size of that root. And you can always just pull up one to test it. Most root vegetables, uh, I think that I can safely say all root vegetables um, are, they, they prefer cooler weather. Now, I'm here in Arkansas where it is currently uh, 90 degrees here pretty early at the morning. So that's why I don't have a lot of roots in my garden right now. I have some like straggler beets and then these carrots that I haven't harvested yet. Honestly, their flavor has probably suffered because I've left them in the garden when it was hot outside. They taste better if you harvest them when it's cold uh, before the weather turns. But uh, that's one of those things that if you really start noticing that they're getting to the right size, it's best if you can to go ahead and start using those ASAP. Harvest them as you need them um, if that's how you want to do it or harvest them all at once if you want to try to preserve them in some way. But uh, root vegetables, their flavor really changes as they mature. They get their texture changes. They tend to get a lot woodier, more fibrous. Um, they sometimes get more bitter, hot in the cases of like um, radishes. They might really take on more of that geosmin chemical compound that makes beets taste like earth. Um, basically young is when you're going to get the best flavor and texture out of them. With carrots, like here I just pulled this one up that was kind of starting to flower and you can see it's starting to put off shoots off. Like basically the flavor of this plant is just not going to be what it could have been uh, if this was harvested at a younger state. Something that I actually get asked a lot about is when to harvest sunflowers. Now here is a sunflower that is one that will produce seeds and so with a sunflower like that that you're trying to harvest to harvest sunflower seeds to eat or for bird food, like dried beans, you actually need to let those come to maturity. Any seeds that a plant is going to produce um, it's going to produce in maturity. So for instance, like a tomato, you want to let that get fully ripe before you save the seeds off that tomato. Now, sometimes seeds from an unripe fruit can grow. I've heard of that happening, but if you're trying to serve, save seeds, you want to give it the best chance as possible. So you, you're going to save seeds from that fully mature squash, from that big yellow cucumber, from a tomato that's fully ripe, from a bean that's fully dry. So in the case of something like a sunflower, where you are trying to harvest sunflower seeds, you want fully mature seeds. So basically what you're gonna let happen is that that flower is gonna grow up and it's gonna bloom. It's gonna be really pretty, but it's not ready yet if what you want is seeds. If you just wanna cut a flower for your kitchen table, that's when you do it. Right as the, the petals are starting to open, you can go ahead and cut it. It'll finish opening on your table in a jar of water. It'll be really lovely. You won't get any seeds from it. If you want the seeds, you leave that plant growing in your garden. What's gonna happen is the head's gonna get bigger and bigger, and eventually the petals are gonna kinda dry up as that head gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and eventually that sunflower head's gonna start drooping forward because it's getting really heavy with all those seeds. And you can, at that point, you wanna cover that thing or else birds are gonna steal your sunflower seeds. A pillowcase or like a tool net bag, something like that, just a bit of fabric put around it and tied off uh, that drooping head and give it a while. I mean, this takes a while. This is going to be towards the end of the season. The back of that sunflower is going to like yellow and turn brown. And that's when you know, and you'll be able to kind of pull a few of the seeds out at that point. But if you're wanting a harvest of seeds, that's what you have to do. If you're just wanting flowers for the table, you can cut them when they're really young. I mentioned alliums. Uh, here I've got some leeks and these are just getting about ready to harvest. Uh, you can see that some of the greenery is beginning to die back. Once this dies back a little bit more, it'll be really time to get these out of the ground. 
a lot of times with things like garlic and onions and leeks, they'll start sending up a center stalk. Um, basically what this is saying is that this probably isn't gonna grow just a whole lot more size-wise. So it's getting to be about time to harvest these. Now, I always pull these center stalks off because they're taking energy away from the plant. In the case of hard neck garlics, these center flower stalks are called scapes and they come up and they curl and uh, you can pull those off and cook them. They're really, really tasty. Uh, for onions and leeks, so you can actually dice these up. Now they're a little bit tough for some bigger varieties. That's what these are. Uh, these are ones my son Ben pulled off yesterday because he's learned that that's something that we do. Um, and for my onions and my leeks, I just pull these off. You can cut them up and use them like green onions. They are just a little bit tough, but they just taste like, this tastes like a leek. With onions and garlic, once that greenery starts really dying back, that's whenever you know that they're about ready to get out of the ground. When they get to the point that they don't have anything really vibrant green in their top parts, uh, they're probably not going to grow just a whole lot. And there's not a lot of benefit at that point to leaving them in the garden because they have that papery skin, that outer layer and it's just going to degrade at that point. So going ahead and harvesting those pretty soon after they start dying back is really the best way to go. They're not gonna get bigger. Storing them in the ground is not really the best thing to do because your garlic will eventually start breaking up into individual cloves. And it's basically just getting ready to survive. It's getting ready to send off more stalks. It's getting ready to reproduce. So going ahead and harvesting them when they're dying back is really the best way to go about it. Now we did a video earlier last week when we harvest all those. I'll put a link down below so you can kind of see how that went. Uh, but we, we went to dry them all out and hang them up and all of that stuff so that they will be better for storage. Haven't got my leeks out of the ground yet though, but it's getting, it's getting pretty close to time. So we'll be pulling those out probably within the next week to week and a half. I would say that they're probably gonna be ready about that point. Now I didn't really stop on the heading brassicas, the broccoli, the cauliflower, the cabbages, because I don't really have, a, I mean, I don't have any broccoli and cauliflower at this point. We've already harvested those a long time ago. I have a few remaining struggling cabbages. Um, they're not much to look at right now. Basically anything like that, when it starts to really develop a nice tight head, you go ahead and cut it out. Broccoli and cauliflower will sometimes produce side shoots so you can leave the plant in. You might get another small harvest off of it. When you get that head of ca cauliflower or broccoli, uh, as soon as it really starts to look filled out, um, it's nice and tight. It's the right color of what the variety that you planted. You usually wanna go ahead and harvest that because what a broccoli or cauliflower head is, it's the like flower, the flower buds of that plant. And sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes there's a short window between that nice lovely head of broccoli and a flowered head of broccoli. And you can sometimes still eat it when it has some flowers on it, but that's not probably what you grew it for. And you know, the best flavor is harvesting that young when the buds are still closed. So as soon as you see that really come to the right size, it's time to, to harvest it. Well, back here in my squash garden, I've got okra here, uh, which we've talked about that. Oh man, here's one I missed. Look at that big old okra. This one is, I might could still eat this, but it's, it's pretty hard. The other day, and this thing would be so hard that it just would be no good. Uh, if you're gonna save the seeds for these, you just gotta keep leaving them on here and eventually they dry up. Let's go ahead and get that off of there. Sometimes you can tell by squeezing them if they're still good to eat. Sometimes when they're big like this, I just try to eat them raw. It's edible. It's pretty okay. It's not great. All right, so I left these out here in the garden just to show you. These are all from the same plant right here. These are all a summer squash. It's a zucchini. It's called Black Beauty. My understanding is that in like the UK, uh, something like this would be called a courgette. I hope I'm saying that right. I'm probably not. And then there's marrows or marrows. Um, and basically here in the US, it's all squash to us. Um, we, we call it all squash. There's summer squash and winter squash, which is the difference between courgette and marrow. Um, so this summer squash is a zucchini. Zucchini is a squash. Um, it's in the same family as things like golden crookneck and, and the things that we more typically call squash. And the way these things do is just like anything else that we're looking at, they're going to grow to a certain point and then they're going to begin to mature. So basically what this plant does is it sets a flower and then it sets a tiny fruit 
And very quickly, it looks like this. This is a really young zucchini. Uh, this is gonna have teeny tiny little immature seeds, really, really soft skin, and really, really tender flesh. Uh, then it's going to grow a little bit bigger. Uh, skin's still fairly soft, the seeds are starting to develop, and the flesh is still pretty tender. As it gets larger, the seeds get larger, the skin gets a little bit harder, the skin's still pretty soft, and the flesh begins to get more spongy. And I don't have one larger than this, but basically if I left this on for a couple more days, it would get even bigger, and it would reach a size, and then it would stop growing in size, but it would continue to mature. The skin would get harder, the seeds would become more mature and harder, and uh, the flesh would get more and more spongy. And when you're gonna harvest squash, really depends on what the purpose of that is. If you're harvesting a summer squash, which you're wanting to eat, a young, tender summer squash, like a squash or zucchini, so includes patty pans, um, the little saucer ones, sometimes they're shaped differently. Those are all summer squash. And I personally prefer these sizes for those. Um, they're so prolific that I don't mind harvesting them young like this, although obviously you're cutting into your volume when you do that, but these on the grill are so tasty, so I really like this size. Uh, this size is also really good for that same purposes, like dicing it up and sauteing or grilling or uh, kebabs or whatever you may do with this. If I'm gonna pickle it, which you can pickle or ferment squash, um, usually I do go for these younger sizes. Once they start getting up until this size, size and the flesh is getting more spongy. Uh, these are more for me at that point uh, for stuffing, for uh, pureeing these to bake with, you know, zucchini bread is something that's pretty popular to use with your extra squash. Um, I definitely don't like this to be the norm. Um, summer squash are gonna get away from you, especially if you have more than just a handful of plants together. This is hard to get down in there and see, and so you're gonna miss some occasionally. You're gonna go out of town for a couple days, or it's gonna rain for a couple days, and you're gonna grow super fast, and you'll end up with these inevitably. Uh, but there's only so many of these that I have stuff to do with. You know, I, at some point. I've got enough frozen squash in my freezer to bake zucchini bread all year long and we start to get sick of eating the same thing all the time so I don't usually do this intentionally this is not something that I, I usually go after inevitably end up with it but uh, what I'm usually going for is right here now winter squash I'm going to show you this plant is sick so this is a spaghetti squash plant just like those zucchinis they start out small with uh, small seeds and thin skin that's a little young spaghetti squash and then they get a little bit bigger you can see this one's getting to be probably close to the size that it's gonna be it's starting to its skin starting to change and these can vary in size uh, here's one that's coming along a little more now this one's skin is definitely getting harder I'm not gonna really go after it with my thumbnail now how you tell if these are ready to harvest is you just try to pierce them with your thumbnail and you're wanting to allow that skin, uh, that outer rind of that squash to get hard enough that you cannot readily pierce it with your thumbnail. Now some winter squashes, some uh, pumpkins, and uh, just different different big winter squashes, those are gonna require further curing. So once they get to that point of being hard, you're gonna cut them off with a really long stem and you're gonna set them out somewhere. Uh, a lot of times in the sun, I will do this in my greenhouse because it's kind of filtered sunlight, uh, but you're gonna set those out. And sometimes you let them cure for up to a month to allow that skin to just really age and get nice and tough so that some of those winter squashes you can store for up to a year. That is if they've been cured properly they'll store for that long but they have to be cured to do that all right here's the potato patch and I also did a video back here last week harvesting uh, over a hundred pounds of potatoes out of this bed and I left one row here I didn't feel like they were quite ready yet they're starting to look more like it now you can tell your potatoes are ready when the tops of the vines really start dying back and these have quite a bit of green left on them so I'm gonna give them a little while longer to die back but you're starting to see it they're laying over they're getting brown they've already flowered at this point so potato plants will flower sometimes they produce an, an, an inedible uh, it's actually Actually toxic fruit you don't want to eat that uh, they don't always produce fruit mine actually didn't so they're but they did flower and then just a couple weeks later they started dying back so I'll probably harvest these in a week or so and let them die back a little bit more and here I have some melons now I don't have a ton of melons that are super far along to show you because it's still kind of early in our season for these these over here are watermelons um, they're they're 
young. Same here, I've got some young watermelons. These are really young. Now, you've got two different kinds of melons that you're likely growing in your garden. You've got like musk melon varieties, which is cantaloupes and honeydews, and uh, this is where Kajari melons fall, for those of you who are growing those after seeing them on our channel. And they're super easy, they make it simple on you. Those small little melons, uh, these are some that I love to grow on trellises. I have multiple trellises with plants, they're just barely starting to set fruit. Uh, I always put those on trellises and put them in some sort of support, like pantyhose or bits of a loofah, not like an actual gourd loofah, but like the, the Dollar Tree kind, they're kind of the spongy things. Uh, you can unravel those and use parts of them to tie your plants up. Uh, plastic produce bags, those things, I just tie them in some sort of support to the trellis because what's gonna happen with those melons is when they're ripe, they actually disconnect from the plant. So if they're not tied up, what you're gonna have is a very fragrant and a heartbreaking experience of coming out to the garden and seeing your melons laying on the ground because they fell off and they usually will split when they hit the ground. By the time you get to them, largely they're filled with ants or whatever because they're super ripe and they smell wonderful and they taste wonderful. So I, I like to just put those in bags and then what I do is come to the garden and check my plants and I've got nice ripe food that's just hanging in a bag ready for me to pull it off and, and eat it. Uh, watermelon's a little more difficult because they do not automatically disconnect from the plant. However, However, one of the things that you'll hear is that the field spot, the place where the melon is laying on the ground, uh, goes from being white to like a rich yellow when it's ripe. I actually have found that that's not always like a, a true rule. Like sometimes that's true, but it's not always, always true. I have pulled melons based on that tip before uh, and them not be ripe. The thing that really is gonna be kind of your telltale is when the stem starts to really dry up. Like when you can tell it's not like pumping life to that melon anymore, it starts to get shriveled and dry. And you can very simply just twist that melon, it's gonna pop off. Uh, that's kind of the rule that I go with. It is very disappointing to, to pull a melon and it not be ripe yet. Uh, but you do wanna keep an eye on them because when they do start drying out like that, if you get like a really heavy rain, you'll end up with melons that split because if they're, if they're really getting to the right point and then they get a lot of water intake, you'll end up with splitting and that's also really sad. So that stem is kind of my telltale thing. You can look for the field spot to change colors, but if that is not accompanied with a dry stem, I don't usually go based on that. Um, I've got my big sweet potato patch here. I have no idea. Oh, y'all tell me, when do I harvest these things? I don't know. My first time growing them. <laughs> All right, last stop in the high tunnel. Let's talk about tomatoes and peppers and eggplants. Okay, so here I've got lots of peppers and they are setting their fruit. Most of the fruit is still pretty young. Now, the nature of peppers is that when they start setting fruit, you can actually go ahead and eat that in many cases. Like these really young jalapenos, I can go ahead and pick these and start eating them. We actually typically eat jalapenos green and that is unripe. They turn red uh, whenever they ripen, most varieties. Some varieties turn orange or yellow, depending on what kind of jalapeno it is, but uh, we usually eat those unripe. So with a lot of peppers, like a lot of peppers, like any sort of bell pepper, they're gonna grow green. And then if you have a colorful bell pepper, they're gonna ripen to red or yellow or purple or brown or whatever the variety calls for. But you can harvest them green and just eat it as a green bell pepper. Um, with sweet peppers, they're really gonna develop a lot of their sweetness as they ripen, so it really is best to go ahead and leave those on the plant until they turn the color that they're gonna turn. With hot peppers, they're gonna develop a lot of their heat as they ripen, so like a young green jalapeno is significantly less spicy than a jalapeno that's been left on that plant for longer to get larger um, and to develop more of those those hot chemicals that make it a spicy pepper. Uh, and then as it ripens, as it experiences heat and as it experiences drought, uh, it's gonna get spicier and spicier. And the same thing with a sweet pepper, it's gonna get sweeter and sweeter. So you can start harvesting as soon as the fruit is worth something, as soon as it's big enough to actually be worth picking. Uh, but the longer you leave it on, the more you're gonna get the flavor that you grew it for. I usually will start harvesting some of my sweet peppers pretty young, just a few here and there to dice up in a breakfast scramble or stuff like that, but I, I prefer to leave them till they're a little bit bigger because that's what I wanted. I wanted that that spicier, that sweet. Oh, ground cherries, almost forgot ground cherries. Uh, ground cherries are a cherry tomatillo. 
Um, I don't have any tomatillos growing to show you, but with ground cherries, basically what's gonna happen is they're gonna set these little fruits in a husk and then they're gonna get bigger and eventually they're gonna turn yellow and the fruit inside here is gonna get big enough to kind of split this thing open. Now, ground cherries fall off when they're ripe. Uh, that's why they're called ground cherries because they are typically, typically gathered from the ground. Uh, if you're having pest issues and all the ones that you pick up from the ground have like bugs in them, then you can sometimes capture them on the plant. Uh, if they fall off really easily in your hand, like what we'll do sometimes is if there's a yellow fruit that's still attached to the plant, we'll just kind of touch it and uh, move it a little bit. And if it falls off on your hand, then you know that it's ready and go ahead and harvest it like that. If it's still really attached to the plant, you have to really pluck it off. You're probably not going to get the fullness of that sweet and fruity flavor if you're harvesting them that way. So uh, this year we're growing them here on these fabrics inside this greenhouse to hopefully be able to harvest more uh, good fruit off the ground. I don't think I have any fruiting eggplant yet. They take a little bit longer. I've got like the first starts of some blossoms here. But um, eggplant's gonna set their blossoms and set little baby fruits and they're gonna grow. And as soon as they get to a point that there's enough to them to eat, you can harvest them. However, uh, you know, some varieties are really large. So while you can harvest them young, you're missing out on more volume of harvest than if you go ahead and let them grow bigger. Uh, they are gonna get to a full size and then at that point the quality is gonna start to degrade. Like the, the skin's gonna get tougher, it's probably gonna get some blemishes in it. The fruit is just gonna get spongier and spongier as the seeds uh, ripen more. What I usually do with my eggplants is I watch them really closely and as they're growing in size daily, I just leave them. But when they just get to that point that I notice that they're not growing in size anymore, I go ahead and pick them. And lastly, tomatoes now all i have right now is green tomatoes we've had a few ripe cherries but for the most part we're still unripe in the tomato land more or less tomatoes tell you when they're ready by changing colors now in the past on videos you may have seen me pick tomatoes that were not quite ripe uh, that means they've started changing colors but they still have green shoulders or they're they're just not fully ripe for me i will do that if i know that there's a lot of rain coming because rain is going to dilute the flavor and it's going to um, in a lot of cases it'll cause your tomatoes to split especially if they've not been watered on a real routine which i don't like to water my tomatoes every single day. I like to water them every few days because I like keeping that flavor concentrated. So in a case like that, I will go ahead and harvest an unripe tomato and put it on the windowsill and let it continue to ripen in the house. Ideally, I like to let a tomato ripen on the vine. I do think that that provides better flavor, but it's not always possible. But ideally, I'm gonna watch that thing. I'm gonna see it start blushing. That's when it first starts changing colors. Now your tomatoes are gonna start green. They're gonna grow to a certain size and then they're gonna stop growing in size. And then they're gonna just sit there and look like they're doing nothing for a while. I mean, sometimes weeks, you're gonna have green tomatoes and you're gonna go, are these ever gonna turn? And then you'll just come out one random day and they'll be blushing, they'll be changing colors. It's so exciting. You just have a few days to wait after that point. Once they get to their full ripeness, I like to take some snippers, go ahead, just cut those off the vine. They're good to go. With green tomatoes, like green varieties, like Aunt Ruby's German Green or Malachite Box, there are several that are green. Um, the way that I tell that those are ready is by squeezing them. And what I like to do is with those varieties is that I'm going to squeeze those uh, when they're unripe so that I kind of have a baseline to know what it's supposed to change into, but they start to really feel softer and that's how you know those are ready. Uh, fun fact, you may have heard, if you're from the South, I know you've heard of it, but if you're not, you may have heard of fried green tomatoes. There's a movie called that a while back, but um, fried green tomatoes are kind of a staple in the Southern kitchen. That's something that uh, most people who grew up in the South grew up eating uh, fried green tomatoes out of the garden. Fried green tomatoes are not fried varieties of green tomatoes. They're just unripe tomatoes. So you got big fat green tomato on the plant, even if it's gonna turn red or orange or yellow or whatever, it's gonna be ripe. You can pick that unripe and slice it up and fry it. Uh, I think that probably came, that just eating fried green tomatoes probably came from the fact that, you know, you end up losing some. You accidentally cut off a branch or one falls off or whatever that's green and you could leave it to ripen. Uh, it's not gonna have great, it's not gonna have nearly as good flavor if you have a completely green fruit that ripens inside. You could do that. 
but you could slice it up and fry it. You can also like pickle those, um, like make green tomato relish. There are lots of things that people do with green tomatoes. But a lot of people go, what's your favorite green tomato for fried green tomatoes? Any tomato is great for fried green tomatoes, especially big ones. But uh, yeah, you're looking for that color change uh, once they're fully changed. Now you don't wanna go way too long because there, there will come a point that it's fully ripe and at that point it's just downhill. It's just gonna get mushy and mealy. So as soon as that thing is fully changed in color is when I go ahead and cut it off. And I will sometimes air just slightly to the side of unripe because I know it can finish ripening in the house and I don't wanna mushy tomato. So I think that covers pretty much everything at least pretty much everything that I grow much of. Again, please leave your comments down below. I know you guys have so much valuable information to share with everyone. And so if you have any tips or things that you look for in harvesting the food in your garden, I'd love to see those tips down below. But I think that's everything that I personally have to share with you on that topic. I will be showing you harvesting and giving you more tips about harvesting and what to do with the food that you harvest over the course of the next few months. This is the time of year where I love making videos because I'm such a visual learner. So I love being able to show you what it is that I'm talking about. So I'm gonna be making lots of content, doing lots of garden tours and harvest videos, as well as teaching stuff like this. Thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. I bless you, until next time.